the so-called crises at the border and on Ohio highways. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Jeremy Pelzer, State House reporter for Cleveland.com. Jim Siegel, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch. Janetta King of Innovation Ohio. And Gene Krebs, former state legislator. A few days removed from the State of the Union address and only days away from another government shutdown deadline, there still appears to be no deal on a plan to better secure the southern border. President Trump made illegal immigration the centerpiece of his State of the Union address, spending nearly 15 minutes making his case that it poses a threat to the country. He called on congressional negotiators to approve his plan. My administration has sent to Congress a common-sense proposal to end the crisis on the southern border. It includes humanitarian assistance, more law enforcement, drug detection at our ports, closing loopholes that enable child smuggling, and plans for a new physical barrier or wall to secure the vast areas between our ports of entry. In the past, most of the people in this room voted for a wall, but the proper wall never got built. I will get it built. Lawmakers from Ohio both disagreed and agreed with the president. They disagreed on plans for the wall, but they agreed they don't want to see another shutdown. You know, I think the president's plan is better than he described. In other words, I, I think it does exactly what many Democrats are asking for, which is relies on the experts along the border through an evidence-based approach to say what kind of structures are going to be where. It's 234 miles that he's proposing in addition to what's already been built by other administrations. Members on both sides of the aisle agree that another government shutdown would be disastrous for the economy, for the people, and unnecessarily harm tens of millions of Americans. Jeremy, if it was up to Congress, this would get done. Neither party wants another shutdown. Neither party wants another shutdown, but then both sides want their way, and that's what got us in this mess in the first place. Uh, and in Ohio, it's really breaking down, not surprisingly, on party lines. Yeah, Rob Portman, he, he basically, I think he explained the president's plan. The two, he said 235 miles of fencing would be a part of this plan, not necessarily a coast-to-coast -a -coast wall. Is that something that the, that the president can go for? Uh, or does he want knows? his wall? Who knows? Yeah. I mean, the, the president does, you know, have a tendency sometimes to shift positions on, on this kind of thing. Uh, so I don't, I don't know where he's ultimately going to end up. I mean, I mean, and, and how many miles is actually needed? I mean, there, there are literally par portions of the border where a wall would make zero sense because there, there's water, there's, there's, there's canyons, there's, yeah. you know, impassable land anyway. Um, oh, one of the problems with it, I mean, there's a, there's a couple problems, though, and, and they're right. I mean, the, the Democrats in the past have supported a, a wall, and there is a wall built yeah. already to a degree. The problem now is because of all the tone and rhetoric we've heard over the last uh, two years, this has become not just a wall, it's become a symbol of things like xenophobia and racism. Um, you've got the problems with the child separations at the border. Yeah. Um, and let's not forget the president said about 600 times that Mexico was going to pay for it. So these make, it's not just about, well, hey, you've, you like a, you've liked a wall before, you should still like it. It's different now. And I, do, and I don't know that they're going to come to an agreement, especially considering the way the president's poll numbers dropped the last time the government shut down. Uh, I, I don't know that there's enough incentive for the Democrats to to move his direction. You know, if they if the Democrats agree to any kind of physical barrier, doesn't that give Donald Trump room to claim victory, and that they don't want that to happen? Maybe, but they also don't want the government to shut down either. So, you know, I do hope that they could come and, you know, figure out ways to use technology, other barriers, something that, um, you know, allows the government to stay open, but then also, you know, gives Donald Trump, you know, a, a, a way to deal, you're right, with this symbol. This has escalated in such a, a problematic way that it really is hard to see, unless somebody moves and shifts, um, how it's going to de-escalate. Gene, how big a, I was surprised after the last election in November that immigration was the number two issue in the exit polls in Ohio. Mm -hmm. It's not really an issue here, but it's a symbolic issue, as we've been talking about. It's because everybody's watching nationalized cable TV, 
and I did not generate this particular structure idea for this, but what, we, what we're seeing now is that every issue that comes up is a new Rorschach test. You know, those ink blots that psychologists show people and you see maybe a, you know, two peacocks kissing or something. Well, everything that comes up, the right and the left, immediately divide into, I see this, no, no, I see that. And so you look at the State of the Union, the wall, all that, this is why I think it's becoming so difficult for the right and the left to begin to have conversations about this very important policy issues and come to some understanding. They just don't see things like well, it anymore. Donald Trump has also told people to be afraid of immigration. You know, they, that's a big bully pulpit as the president to say, these are the enemies, and it's working. I mean, it does break through, and it's really problematic because he's scapegoating these people. Turning to other issues that were in the State of the Union, Jeremy, trade, got a, got a slight mention. That's, of course, of importance to Ohio, both manufacturing and on the agriculture side. But he didn't really break new ground when it came to, came to the trade in the, in, the, in the address. I think trade is obviously to kind of one side now as they're working out in the, the shutdown and the wall and North Korea and all these other issues, trade, uh, you know, but it's going to pop up and it's going to be an issue in 2020, I'm sure. Education? Yeah. Barely you mentioned. The federal government talks doesn't about do much with education. Yeah. Mostly you want federal government to stay out of education. Yeah. I mean, let's be frank. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think back with that, with that trade issue. WKBN in Youngstown did an interesting story where they sat down with three Lordstown workers who were about to be laid off, GM and, workers, and yeah. GM workers, and and watched the, the the speech with them. And and speaking of trade and manufacturing, they were they were really not happy with the way the speech went. They felt oh. like they didn't get the due that they should have gotten after the president kind of made some promises about bringing back some jobs into that plant and and uh, and. And when one was asked about, well, what about the wall and, you know, on the border, he said, look, I'm not as worried about the folks coming over the border looking for more opportunity. I'm worried about the, the folks still living in Mexico who are doing our jobs at, yeah. at the plants that used to be here. But then I have to point out that, I hate to be data nerd here, but 88% of the jobs lost in America in the last 30 years have been lost due to automation, mm -hmm. only 12% due to offshoring. And so it's easy, overly easy and convenient. And I have to, once again, I think the media, sorry, y'all, but it's, you know, you know, it's not talking enough about the, how automation's affecting the, the, these jobs. Well, in this State of the Union, too, was a little bit of an opening salvo for Trump's reelection. Yep. And so, you know, I think there was a reason that Congressman Tim Ryan brought someone from the UAW, the United Auto Workers, to the State of the Union um, who were, was directly impacted by Lordstown. Because I think where the problem was going to be is Trump made very big promises, especially when it comes to manufacturing. And if the lived experiences of Ohioans and the people in the Mahoning Valley don't add up to what they were promised, I think that's going to be a problem. All right. Sherrod Brown may not be an official presidential candidate, but he's at least trying it out. He is off to New Hampshire this weekend. His Dignity of Work tour visited Iowa last weekend. He made several stops to speak to potential caucus voters. He says he is not concerned about his progressive record as much as how Democrats can win back those rural blue-collar voters. I don't worry about progressive bona fides. I worry about Democrats talking to workers in winning, you know, winning places like Howard County and winning places where um, Democrats don't do so well in, in small city Ohio and small city Iowa. Janetta King causing a little bit of a stir, but he still hasn't really caught fire like Cory Booker or Kamala Harris has. What's, what's taking so long for him? Yeah. Well, I think the more people understand what Sherrod Brown could mean as a presidential candidate, the more Democrats are going to like him, because here's what he can do. He can unite the traditional Democratic coalition. It is a both and. It is the white working class and it is the progressive base, and which makes him very electable when other candidates maybe are good with their progressive bona fides or maybe try to appeal to the white work, working class, he can do both. So I think he's going to be doing these tours. He's going to be in New Hampshire. He's going to be in, you know, did Iowa. I think he's going to be very well received by people who understand what he could do and how electable he could be. Can he, Jeremy, can he energize that progressive base like a Kamala Harris or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders did or even Cory Booker? Well, the, uh, the media narrative on Brown until now has kind of been he's been he's the Trump voter whisperer. He is the populist economic populist who won in a red state. Uh, but his job now is to if he just has that he's not going to win a Democratic nomination. So his job now is to reach out and reach those 
um, liberal activists, those, you know, Democrats around the country who aren't, you know, necessarily white, blue-collar males. And that's why he's going out and doing this, and um, we'll see if he can do it. I think he's going to run, yeah. personally. Well, he's the Midwestern guy, too. I mean, he's the guy they think, that some think, and, and really the only chance he has is if he can convince everyone he's the guy who can win Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. If he, if he can't win those states, then there's no point in him being in the race because, you you know, Kamala Harris and, Cor and Booker and others, they can, they can handle the coasts. Yeah. Uh, he needs to show that he can, he can sell in the heartland. And, and he's, he, again, he's trying to show that he's, he's, this is what real populism looks like. Um, I think it is a, he, you know, he's very unpretentious. He's, he's a very different kind of candidate than, obviously, than the president and on a, uh, in terms of style, uh, which is, there's always a different way to call him rumpled and, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and disheveled. Uh, everybody yeah, comes up with a new adjective. Uh, so, so it'll be interesting to see once, once he's done with the, you know, the dipping his toe in the water and he actually gets in the race, who's going to back him? Who, who's, and, and I'm talking about money. Yeah. Uh, wh where's the money going to come from? And that, that will immediately start to tell you is he gaining traction? Yeah, and that is the key thing. Uh, you know, there's a thing about magicians, don't pay attention to what's in this hand, look, see what this hand's doing. So when he goes to Iowa, uh, that's nice, but the really watch is when is he going to San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, and Miami? And uh, what polling indicates right now- um, Those cities are where the money is. That's where the, the money is, is. Yeah. it's fundraising is. Now, I'm, I'm a Republican and I'm gonna speak for what Democrat polling is, which is a dangerous thing to do. But what it seems to indicate is, is the thing that, that the Democrat vote Voters value the most is a someone who who will be viable against Trump, and it doesn't really matter so much where they are on all. Do they check all the boxes? They're looking at how are they going to perform against Trump, and that may be a strength. However, remember he, a lot of us were stunned at what his total was here in Ohio. He did not do as well as what a lot of people were thinking, and so it may. You know, he's about four points down from where a lot of people in the polls were putting him at. So he may not have quite the translation that people were thinking. He was sitting next to Kamala Harris at the State of the Union. Mm -hmm. I felt bad for him because every time they showed her, you could sort of see his <laughs> stray gray hair. Mm -hmm. But is that a ticket? Because everyone says that Brown would be a good vice presidential ticket, uh, running mate to someone like. Kamala Harris. Is that a... I think they would both love to be on a ticket. I think they would disagree who would be at the top of the ticket. Yeah. And the other big thing about um, Sherrod is that if he, if he runs and he wins either one or two, that means then Governor DeWine appoints. And if he wins. If he wins. I think Dees would take that deal. Well, okay. It means they've but it's Donald number Trump. two, though. But it means they've defeated Donald Trump. But it means it's number two, though. Yeah. That I think that's a different dynamic versus number one. So that's why I don't think it's it's one or none for him. Oh, top of the ticket or nothing. Yeah, because I don't. I think the Democrat money will go. Okay, well we can put. There's a lot of people who could yeah. fill in as being number two very Absolutely. effectively, but then we lose a Senate seat automatically. Yeah. Well, could be. If you think this season's crop of potholes is bad, state officials say it's going to get worse. Ohio's transportation director says the state faces an impending crisis unless they generate more money for road repairs and improvements, proving that government task forces can work quickly. Just days after it was formed and after one hearing, Governor DeWine's Advisory Committee on Transportation Infrastructure recommended the state increase the gas tax to pay for highway fixes and projects. Jim, this was government fast tracking. So will yes. this pass in the legislature as quickly as it did in this committee? <laughs> well, that is a lot bigger question. There, there wasn't, I mean, look, no, there wasn't a whole lot of surprise uh, that the committee is, is recommending a gas tax increase considering the timetable and considering who was on it. Uh, look, I mean, I think there's a realization. I don't know that Governor DeWine is happy about it at all, but there is a realization that without some short, without some money now, there's going to be a definite drop off in what we can do with maintenance and what we can do with major inter interstate construction. Uh, basically, the problem is we, we, Governor Kasich back in 2013 did bonding against future turnpike tolls. That was fine. It raised a billion and a half dollars that was much needed for transportation projects. That money's gone. Yeah. It's run out. Uh, basically, it's all accounted for. So they need to find, find money again to do that. And there is, from all the, the testimony and talk, there, there's definitely a need to look more long term at what do we do to fund our roads that's going beyond just a gas tax because, you know, as more and more cars don't use as much gas, it's going to be necessary. However, 
In the short term, there is no one really coming up with solutions that's going to raise $500 million to a billion dollars a year other than raising that gas tax by 5 to 15 cents. That was my next, Jeremy. Any, they, this commission, this committee did not recommend an amount to raise the gas tax. So what's a logical number? Is it 5 cents, 10 cents? Uh, well, right now, cents? well, right now it's 28 cents. 28 cents is the right now it's 28. Yeah. So that's their starting point. So um, uh, I think that would, if they, if the legislature can agree on the principle of it, then they're going to start arguing about the number. I mean, I, I think it's too early to say what that number would be, but it's not going to be just a one cent gas tax. If they do it, it's, if they do it, it's going to be a substantial amount. Right, because the need is so big. I mean, this neglect is is real. Um, I think DeWine is not happy about being handed the situation. He's either going to have to, you know, oversee a, a gas tax increase or go eight years without investing in infrastructure, which is not uh, viable for him. So I first started talking about this. So you could roll the tapes. Oh, I remember. Back in 2005, and um, Governor Strickland was gracious enough to appoint me to his 21st Transportation Advisory Committee. I was not on the portion that dealt with the funding aspect of it, but that report did call for one of the interesting things, which nobody's talking about here, which I find interesting. I want to get input from folks on what things they called for was allowing the gasoline sales to be subject to the state sales tax which would guarantee then a specific amount of money going locally because one thing we know is the locals do not trust the state to keep any of their deals. Uh, and that may, that may deal with it. And that did not come up, and I'm curious as to why, but this is not so would that be above issue. and beyond the 28 cents gas yeah. tax? Mm -hmm. So be yeah. 57.5% yeah. here in Franklin County yeah. or whatever it is. But the thing is, is that um, this has been going on um, for a very long time period, and uh, I do have to commend the Governor DeWine. He has come in and, you know, in, in his um, inauguration speech, he says, I'm taking a 30-year look at things. And I think it's very nice to have a governor who's not just looking to the close of business that day or even four years from now or eight years from now. He's looking long term, and I think that's very commendable. Yeah. You know, I, I think it does remain to be seen how the legislature deals with this, because I imagine there are a lot of Republicans who don't want anything to do with a tax increase. Um, so this could be an example of bipartisan legislation that, you know, has both Democrats and Republicans voting on it. That said, I think they're going to have to look at things like public transit and other things that the Democrats care about instead of just a pure gas tax with nothing else in it. They talked about electric vehicles, Jeremy, and putting some kind of a fee on electric vehicles, because there's some on the road now, and there'll be more in the years ahead. What are they talking about there? Uh, again, it's kind of up in the air. Uh, it, there's a, kind of a general recommendation to look at this, but then when you get in the legislature, uh, you know, the, the Democrats will kind of resist that, and you'll... And the question is, how much money will it really make? Can you, at this point, I mean, in the future, yeah, but are you going to... I mean, you can't just uh, put a tax or a fee on electric vehicles now and make up for a gas tax. That's just yeah. a, a drop in the bucket, so... It'd be hard to exempt them as more and more Teslas get on the road and more Chevy Volts or mm. Nissan Leafs who are on the road. It'd be unfair to exempt them from a tax if they're using the same roads as the gasoline-powered cars are. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason they, they want to see... A lot of the groups pushing for more revenue want to see some type of a fee attached to hybrids and electric cars because it's just a matter of fairness. If you're going to use the roads, you should help pay to keep them up. Um, however, as Jeremy said, I mean, we're talking a couple million dollars, probably less than less than five even million dollars a year that could that could honestly be raised these you know today on on a, on the fee system. There just aren't that many cars like that that are sold in Ohio yet. So again, when you're talking about an infusion of revenue in the next two years, there is really very few options besides a gas tax. Gee, let me ask you if Grover Nordquist Group says they, they oppose any kind of a tax increase. So our Republican lawmakers, particularly ones in the Senate, perhaps, mm -hmm. are they going to be saying, you know what, I don't want the wrath of this Americans for Prosperity, whatever the group, mm -hmm. taxation group, whatever it's called, mm -hmm. coming down on me because I voted for this gas tax even though it makes sense and we need it. Well, there are, there are two considerations here. One is the gas tax is actually more of a user fee than it is actually a tax. But the other thing is... I you change the name, we're good? Well, but I remember, though, very clearly, though, in 06, when then-Representative Jim McGregor of Gahanna was running for re-election, he was absolutely vilified in the TV ads for having voted for the Bob Taft gas tax. And this goes to Janetta's point. So if, if there is going to be a approval 
for the gas tax to go through. Everybody has to, but this goes to one of the key things. The way that the ODOT budget is structured, they have to have that passed and in place by April 1st. I really like the ODOT director, Jack Marchbanks. He, but he cannot visit enough Rotary Clubs all across the state to get this message out. What they absolutely need to do is convert the regular ODOT budget into a even year budget, not an odd year budget. Just do a temporary one year patch up, continuing budget for it right now and send Jack out there to talk to everybody for a full year and explain, here's the situation, what would you be willing to accept and extend their ears to listen? This is not just a talk at session, but to also find out from all everybody, Rotary Clubs, Lions, everybody, what is it you're willing to accept? Well, on the other hand, you're gonna be passing a budget in an election year too, so. That's true, but right now the problem with the core problem with ODOT's budget is that it comes on in a hurry. We don't even know who the committee chairs are, okay? And so nobody knows what, so that's why ODOT is the, traditionally been the agency of the status quo. All right. And that's why we've seen this happen. There are a lot of Republican voters in Columbus. Columbus has a rich history of popular Republican mayors, Greg Lashutka, Buck Reinhardt, Tom Moody, Jim Rose, if you go back far enough. But this year, there is no Republican running for mayor, not even one Republican running for city council. A statement from the Franklin County GOP says it is impossible for their candidates to compete because the outcome is already fixed. Now, Gene, you've served in Columbus, but you live in, in western Ohio, mm -hmm. so you don't have really a dog in this fight. But it can't be good for the Ohio Republican Party, the largest city, does not have one person running for a city office. And I will tell you, I remember fondly, you had three people at separate times run for city council here. Heidi Samuel, Eddie Pauline, Matt Ferris, all ran picture-perfect campaigns, great candidates, they all lost. And I think it's because of the fact that Columbus is a, you know, at large, and there's been a <coughs> reform <laughs> measure put forth, which is, a, I think, a farce. And um, if you, when you read the book, Bridges Across Every Divide, I know you all have, but when you do so, you find out that the size of the district tends to inhibit democracy. When you have a million people living in a city, you, that's why you need to go to districts and you need to have a bona fide district where people can begin to have a relationship with that representative council person. And what you've seen so far, but this is, this is why this reason and the, and the reluctance of the city power elite to begin to come up with a structure to share power is one of the things that explains why everybody is so angry and unhappy. 40% of Democrats voted for Bernie Sanders, 40% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump. They rejected the existing power structure in both cases. But there are a lot of bus big businesses here. They tend to vote Republican, but Mayor Ginther and then Mayor Coleman before him has done a good job of cultivating those business interests and almost acting like a, like a Republican in some way. Yeah, I think that they are moderate Democrats, and a lot of Democrats criticize them for being moderate Democrats. But I, you know, I think that they are doing a good job representing the the city. The demographics are, you know, what they are, and you know, you, the the comment that it was fixed. I mean, it makes it sound like there's not, you know, a democratic system in place. There is a democratic system in place. They just have done a good job governing and are likely going to get more votes. And I'm sure those who are, you know politically connected and interested can find the the irony in listening in hearing any Republican party talk about outcomes being fixed in Ohio just because of the the, the troubles that the uh, Democrats have had for years especially with gerrymandering across the state but uh, that being said I mean I'm, I'm not sure they're wrong I mean look Rich Cordray won Franklin County by 30 points. Uh, Ted Strickland only won it by eight or nine. I mean, yeah. this this county's turned w way bluer, yeah. especially under Trump. And but but it is still good to have competition. It's good to force these guys to talk about issues you want to talk about. Force Andy or for, force force the Gin, uh, mayor Ginther to talk yeah. about other issues. Challenge him on his positions. Uh, that, that's good for democracy. Jeremy, this isn't unique to Columbus. I mean, you look at the big cities: Cleveland, uh, Washington D.C., New York City. Yeah. Heavily Democratic areas. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I totally agree that uh, with Jim that the big issue is just competition because uh, more than having uh, parties, per se, because a lot of these issues you handle in the city, uh, you know, building permits, 
uh, where you put a stoplight, uh, that kind of, I mean, taxes, sure, but those aren't really Republican or Democratic issues. And so you'll have, um, you know, you were talking about fundraisers and, you know, there's a lot of re rich Republicans. Well, you know, if they can do business with a Democratic yeah. city council person, they're happy to do so. All right, let's get to our off the record parting shots. Gene, you're up first. Uh, if you really want to understand the state budget, the best way, I believe, is to read the book, Follow the Money, from my uh, think tank that I used to work for called Center for Community Solutions. Go to their website. It will be available after Tuesday at 5. All right, mark your calendars. Janetta. I think public education uh, advocates have been surprisingly encouraged by um, Speaker Householder's uh, comments that he may want to fix public education in this budget. Jim. Uh, I will say that I do, you know, if, if, if the legislature is going to do a gas tax, it will be uh, of good size because, as Gene was saying earlier about getting hit with attack ads, you're going to get hit with an attack ad whether you pass a two cent gas tax that doesn't do enough or you pass a 15 cent gas tax. So my guess is they'll uh, do, the, do the latter if they do one at all. And Jeremy? I think the heartbeat bill will be signed into law by the 4th of July. By Governor DeWine. By Governor DeWine. And then in court by the 5th of July. With fireworks, <laughs> yeah, with, with a 4th of July picnic. Yeah. All right. Um, just a plug for a show, our Sunday listeners, this won't do you much good, but Saturday night at 8 o'clock, WOSU TV is airing the documentary, the terrific documentary on Fred Rogers, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Highly acclaimed. Make time. Watch it Saturday night at 8 on WOSU TV. If you miss it, I think it's on HBO, it's around somewhere else, but it's uh, well worth your time. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook, Twitter, each episode on demand at our website, wosu.org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week. <laughs>